Yeah, we're going to be talking about a really interesting subject. Are you coachable? Stand up if you are coachable. <laughs> what a surprise that everybody stood. Well, well, a couple of people. Oh, it was a coach. Oh, okay, okay. All right, sit down, please. In order to be successful, you have to be coachable. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And uh, I guess the great thing I'd like to start off with about coachability is that the beautiful part of it is it not only applies to curling, it applies to life. So it's the beautiful thing about sport, and it's the beautiful thing about curling, is that the lessons you learn as competitive curlers are so applicable to other aspects of life. So someday when you're working uh, full time and uh, you know as part of a company or whatever it is you choose to do for a career, stuff you learn like uh, working as part of a team, working under pressure and so on are good things that you'll learn through sports. So I always think that's a great thing about curling. Well, let me ask you this. There's a common thread when you look at Canadian junior champions over the past 20 years. People who win championships are very coachable. It's an important, a really important part of success. And so that's why we're uh, talking about it today, so that you can, uh, you can look at that as a concept. And you know what? The opposite almost applies as much. I know there's luck involved in success, but certainly a common thread is that many great teams and many great players never make it. And one of the big reasons is they were not often coachable. So it, it is part of why you'll be successful or, or, or not successful. So what do you think of that? Okay, if you already know it all, no one can help you. If you determine to learn, no one can stop you. Like that? Somebody once said it's amazing um, how much you can learn after you think you know it all. And that applies to so many different things in life, but it certainly applies to curling because one of the things about curling is it's a changing uh, circumstance. So the strategy that worked 10 years ago maybe doesn't work today. And, and so you have to always be learning. And one of the ways that you learn is by being coachable and listening to the advice that's given you by your coaches, but also other ways that you pick up information. I think that's one of the great things about junior curling and competitive junior curling and curling on TV. There's so many different ways to gather information and learn more about our great sport. And so you know, that's always an, an important thing so you can keep learning and therefore getting better. Now, if you, just to pick up on this just a little bit more, I mean, I think one of the important things here is you need to have natural curiosity about the game. So if you're uh, on a team, I think it's important that you're curious about, so for example, I won't mention any teams, but there's a couple of teams that I talked to that are 0-2 today. So maybe it's a good time to be curious about why they're all in two. They could have a good conversation about that, and that would help them get better. And, um, and they can do that by talking to their coaches. They can do that by talking amongst themselves. But curiosity is a very important part of coachability, especially after really close wins or really close losses. Because that's when you learn, well, if we'd just done this, we might have been able to win. Or if, uh, you know, why did we win? We just placed, uh, played against the number one ranked team, and we're just a bunch of 13 and 14-year-olds trying to make the big time in U18, and we beat them. So by being curious and talking about that, you can figure out probably why it is that you, you won. And normally it's not because of luck, it's because you did some things really, really well. Some signs that an athlete is not coachable. Constantly playing on different teams. And, and really, I, I don't know, I don't have any privileged information ahead of time. But you know what, if you're constantly playing on different teams, then maybe that is a message. I know there's age factors and so on, but uh, 
There is more than one great team to play on, but if you're constantly changing teams, well, maybe that is a bit of a message that uh, hmm, seldom keep up their end of the bargain. So practice is today at 2 o'clock, and, and an athlete is continually late. Or uh, you say you're going to practice two or three times a week, and you don't. Those are the kinds of things that are difference makers. If three people are doing all of that and the fourth person isn't, it makes it difficult for that team to be really successful. It takes four people to be really successful. So it's important that everybody make that commitment. Takes things personally when being critiqued. So when you're having discussions as a team, uh, coaches are trying to help you get better and um, it's really important to embrace critique because if you embrace critique obviously you have a really good chance to get better and if you don't then it's very difficult to have dialogue as a team or with the coach that will help you move forward and maybe not make the mistakes that are that are being uh, you know uh, making a difference in a, in a game vital to be able to do that. But at the same time, coaches have to be very good at making sure when they're doing critique, they do it in such a way that it uh, is not perceived to be negative, but perceived to be constructive. And, uh, and certainly one of those ways for coaches is to not be on tell mode, but to ask questions, get clarification, and stuff like that to try and get answers as to why things didn't go well from your athletes. Poor seasons are never their fault. You, you, season's over, well, I did what I was supposed to do, but you know, we didn't do well. You, that happens. And, uh, and that means it's that kind of person who perhaps isn't coachable and will be you know, moving on to play on another team or uh, not playing in the same position or, or whatever. Always have an excuse for failure, you know? doesn't stand up and say, you know what, I threw that one heavy as the rock goes to the back 12 foot, but instead says something like, I think it's really keen there. So when the skip comes up to throw, what happens? Skip throws it light. You lose the game, right? So it's really important for people to uh, take responsibility if you're going to be coachable uh, when there are poor outcomes. And it's silence after a miss that is a killer for teams. So if you're coachable, you know that it's important after a miss for somebody to say something. It was either thrown poorly, brushed poorly, or called poorly, or a combination of those things above. But if there's silence, then everybody's scratching their head going, they must have think I overswept that. Or they must have thought I turned that one in. Or the skip's thinking, gee, they must have thought I gave them bad ice. And then you can't move on to making the next shot. So you want to try and be very coachable so that you don't mind admitting when you've done something that didn't help. Because then you can move on to the next shot. And then it keeps a nice, strong bond with your team from a team dynamics point of view, rather than people internalizing and being mad at each other because no one uh, took responsibility for the outcome. Never quite seem to find the right coach. Gee, we're paying them expenses when we remember. I don't know why our coaches lined up to coaches because it's really very good from a financial point of view. But yeah, players who always are not happy with the, with the coach that they've got. I'll tell you, in curling, we are not as fortunate as they are in the hockey business, because in the hockey business, people try and play professional hockey after, let's say they play major, junior A or whatever, try to play in the NHL, don't make it, come back to where they live, are playing in sort of recreational hockey and want to give back to the game. So at 25 or 26, we have all these wonderful hockey players with strong technical skills and really know the game well, that are ready to give in, uh, give back to the game. In curling, we make competition so 
exciting and available for everybody till they're about 100 years old, that a lot of competitive curlers just keep on playing. And so that means uh, we have to uh, thank parents who are the ones that usually put their hands up and say, you know what, we need a coach. And, uh, and so we're very grateful and very fortunate that way. And I know that coaches work hard at learning more about the game, just as you do. And, uh, and so it's, it's important to embrace them and support them and help them in their work as well. So what does it mean to be coachable in curling? I sort of alluded to it. So, I mean, I think it's as simple as you're striving to be the, the best that you can be. At the same time, I would say, let's remember the definition of insanity. And that is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. How's that working for you? So we're going to practice twice a week, but we're never going to practice as a team. Well, I can tell you, for example, that the John Morris team, when they won a World Juniors, practiced once a week as a team at 6 a.m. Because that was the only time we could get together as a team. And it was a difference maker. And if you look at swimming, and you look at gymnastics, and you look at uh, other sports, uh, uh, they practice nice and early. Swimming, I, I think I mentioned that as well. So that's something that you can do. Rather than doing the same old stuff or having the same old excuses, oh, we can't practice because, you know, it's, it's a, an hour and a half drive and blah, blah, blah. Well, I know that the other thing teams do is they join two or three clubs, you know, as they get a junior spare uh, 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 membership, and that allows them then to have some success because now they've got access to ice. I just want to speak for a moment about characteristics of Olympic <coughs> champions. And the Olympics has been wonderful for curling because um, it has really made a difference in terms of how serious curlers are to try and win that gold medal. And so we're now looking at, at more than just practicing and throwing rocks down the ice, so many other things. So here are some things that I think that you should know about Olympians, and they probably won't surprise you, but they dream big. So I'll bet you there's somebody in this room right now that is going to win a Canadian championship one day. And part of the reason they're going to win it is because they are going to dream big. Why not? We live in the best curling country in the world. And so it means if, and, and in, in Ontario, typically, we are very competitive at the sport of curling. So... If you win Ontario, there's a good chance you'll win Canada. And if you win Canada, there's a very good chance you'll win the Worlds. So I think you should dream big. And there should be no reason why you should apologize for that, but just do it. You have to be passionate about your sport. If, it's, if you really want to be successful, so if you want to be coachable again, you want to be make sure that you are passionate, which means you'll be really motivated to work hard to be successful. You need to have goals and a plan. And goals without a plan are just a wish. Ah, let's win Ontario this year, U18s. Yeah, that's our goal. What's the plan? Well, I don't know. We haven't talked about that yet, but maybe, I guess we should practice and go on a couple of spiels. And that's not going to cut it. You need a really specific plan. And when it comes to a season plan, you can play too much. And you can play too little. You need to be somewhere in the middle in terms of the schedule of practicing and league games and bond spiels and stuff like that. You want to be, if you want to be like Olympians, you want to be a learning machine. You're always thirsting for knowledge to learn more about the sport. If you talk to Olympians, perfection is the goal. Excellence will be tolerated. Very good isn't good enough. So if you really want to be a champion, you really need to shoot for trying to be perfect all the time. And certainly, Olympians are very coachable. Remember what we said earlier about last 20 years of Canadian juniors have been won? Those athletes are very coachable. They were. If you do all of those things Olympians do, then anything is possible. Anything is possible for you to achieve. 
Okay, let's talk about two athletes I'm familiar with. I was lucky enough to coach John uh, off and on for about five or six years, and I coached Rachel for 10. I coached her from the time she was 13 till she was 20, and then we took a couple of years off, and then I coached them in 2013 and 2014 when we played in the Scotties. Lucky enough to win the Scotties here in Kingston in 2013, and in 2014 won it again in Montreal. So were they coachable? Well, let's talk about that. There's John Morris's Little Rock team back in 1990. Now what's interesting about this picture is Rachel Holland's older brother is in this picture. Okay, and Mark Holman. He was a very good hockey player, got away from curling, but he's now come back to it, but he was at National Juniors with us eventually. Bantams, okay, starting to look familiar. Bantam team, back in 92 and 93, we were guys from Ottawa wondering if we could go and play the big dogs in Toronto, whether we'd have a chance. And it was always really important to use Toronto as sort of the barometer of how good curling was, because we just thought that's where it was, because it's the biggest city in Ontario. So we went down two years in a row and were able to win the... Uh, TCA Bantam Championships, and we're very proud of that. And who's this guy? Greg Savile was the third on the team, and Rachel's older brother still, and another guy that I don't think is curling anymore that you wouldn't know. Was he coachable as a junior? Well, not right away. Okay? So it's not expected that you would be coachable right away as you're working your, up, or your way up. But I can tell you that... Uh, that John is a skip, didn't have good body language to start with. He'd slam his broom, he'd turn his back. I know none of you do that anymore, right? But uh, yeah, so I remember saying to him, John, if, uh, if you want to be successful, you have to sort that out because you're going to run out of players. And if that's what you're doing, that's one of the, the downsides, you're going to run out of players. Everybody in this room, I'm absolutely convinced, is doing everything they, they can do to be the best they can. And whether they make a shot or miss a shot, nobody ever does that on purpose. Yeah, so John's body language, his strategy, as it often is in juniors, was high octane offense, 24-7. That's all they wanted to play, okay? And uh, that doesn't work. And from a, 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 maybe some parents in the room where have experienced this sort of thing, maybe it's an extra special opportunity to have as a parent coach, and that is, there's a little stubbornness and a little bit of communication that we had to work on between the two of us, but yeah, that was back then, and as, as a result, as a coach, I had to work harder at saying, okay, I gotta make sure I really know my stuff, I gotta make sure I communicate effectively. So it's a two-way street here. You guys have to be coachable, but the coaches also have to be able to be receptive to what athletes have to say so they can be effective. And there we are lucky enough as a family to uh, be in Vancouver in Olympic House when John won his gold medal, walked in with that on and uh, my wife Maureen who's in the back of the room and our, our two daughters that are uh, part of that team as well. This is Rachel when she was really young, into fitness in a big way. <laughs> This is my, one of my first meetings with Rachel when she was very young. She was just a, a little rink rat that came to watch her brother play Little Rocks, and she started playing, and then when we won the Ontario Provincials, uh, she came out, and uh, that's her brother's jacket. All right, what about Rachel? You know, was she coachable as a junior? Well, not right away. So there's good news, coaches. If right now it's not maybe going as well as you might hope from a communication point of view, it gets better. And one of the uh, pieces of advice I'd give to coaches in, in the room is hang in there. It's worth it. And uh, it's not always perfect, but uh, nevertheless, it's, uh, it's just the way it is, but not right away. Why? Well, Rachel had difficulty bouncing back. If she missed a shot, she'd feel really badly about it and she'd go quiet. And we had to eventually work on it and say, okay, here's what we gotta do, Skipper. We know it upsets you when you miss a shot. 
We're going to give you five seconds, okay, to get mad at yourself. And once you finish being mad at yourself, take a deep breath, make a positive statement about the next shot, and then park the last one. So we gave her a way of being able to do that that was very effective. And so she didn't bang brooms. Uh, she didn't turn her back anymore uh, when she was mad or upset. But what she might do is put her fist in her pocket and clench her fist for five seconds to show she was angry and get it out. Or take uh, a Scotty's and go to the garbage can and blow her nose into the Scotty's and throw it into the garbage can. And that was a way of parking the miss sort of thing that was very effective for her. Strategy. She's another person like John that has gone high octane offense from the get go. And there's no doubt that Rachel is in my opinion, if she's not the best shooter in ladies curling in the world, she's tied for first place with whoever is. Uh, she's still uh, a work in progress on the strategy side, but she's very, I, I think it's going very, very well for her. And she as well was stubborn. I think it's a trait of many great skips that they really have this opinion on how they want things to go and they're going to stick to it. So you really, as coaches, uh, got to have good conversations to get them to change their mind because they definitely have a certain way of seeing things. So signs that an athlete is coachable. <coughs> keep up your end of the bargain. Okay, coachable curlers keep up their end of the bargain. In other words, they are committed. Yes, they said they practice and they will do so because lots of times now, especially as you get older, People are at different universities, and it's very difficult for people to, uh, to uh, train together. But if you make a commitment to practice so many times a week, then that's important to keep. And athletes who are coachable do that. You embrace critique as an opportunity to get better, and you accept your share of responsibility when things go poorly. You know, uh, whether you curled 68% or 80%, there's still some shots that were missed. So yeah, 80 is better than 68, but you can still be looking internally at what you might have done better if you're the 80 percenter, as opposed to the fact that another player on the team didn't play as well. And you don't make excuses for your failure. You know what? I'm just not throwing those interns well. I'm turning them in. I'm going to practice those and make them better. And you constantly want to strive to master your sport. So then if we look at what that means, I said... Really what coachable athletes are is they're trying to be the best that they can be. And that means in a number of different areas that you're uh, trying to be better. And one of those is strategy. As you try and continue to figure out what is the right strategy. The right strategy is the one that works. If it isn't working and you're 0-2, it might be because you're not making enough shots, but it might be because it's just not your weekend. Or it might be maybe you need to look at your strategy. So if you're always, you know, not doing as well as you hope, maybe you need to look a little bit more at the strategy side. Technical competence. It used to be this is all we ever thought about was just make sure you're strong technically. Well, you need to be strong technically, but you also need to be smart. How many people are familiar with the concept of tolerance on shots? Probably the most important thing I'm going to say today is to remind you uh, of the importance of what your coaches say. You've got to remember tolerance, that you are coachable and you indeed throw the, the rock to, to make it perfectly, but you're aware of what plan B is if you don't make it perfectly. Mental toughness. The ability to perform at a very high level regardless of the circumstances. The draw to the button in the 10th end is no different technically than the draw to the button in the 4th end as long as you are thinking process. Okay, I'm just going to sit in the hack, uh, ask my front end what the weight is, and I'll, 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 I'll come out like I normally do. As opposed to, uh-oh, if I don't make this, we're going to lose the game. If we lose the game, a coach is going to be mad. We, if he's mad, we don't get pizza, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to be careful you, uh, you don't think outcomes. Team dynamics. A lot of coachability is about team dynamics, about getting along with each other, by putting the team first, by being curious. One of the things that we did that helped 
our team, when I speak of Rachel's team being more coachable, is we did something called the ladder drill. When we were doing, uh, after um, a game, we would always debrief, and the first thing we would do is the ladder drill. I would either go up the ladder or down the ladder. If you went up the ladder, it meant the lead would talk about how great the second was, second talk about the third, third talk about the skip, skip talk about the lead. That's how we'd open it up. Because so often, it's all about the skip. Great draw to the button skipper for the win. But then this is a chance to say, well, you know what, if you hadn't made that double takeout in eight, we don't win. And so often we put pressure on the skip for those great shots, but people have to remember that every if you win, it's usually because everybody won uh, or helped out. And the Olympics has certainly put way more uh, impact on healthy lifestyles. And, uh, and we all know what that's all about, staying fit, uh, eating healthy, and getting lots of rest. And, uh, and more and more as you go up the ladder, you'll need more help from a team management point of view. And that all equates to optimal performance. So in closing, I just want to say a couple of things here. First of all, if you're out on the curling ice and you're looking down the sheet at the other end, and this is what you see, these are the eyes of the other skip then you know you're in good shape. Especially if these are the eyes of your skip. And one of the last things I would like to mention is regardless of the circumstances, it always has to be fun. Okay, so it doesn't matter what level you play at, the Teams in World Curling Tour, whatever that level is, it's always gotta be fun. And just a reminder of two more things. Number one, because we live in Canada, anything is possible, but especially in curling, because we're the most powerful nation in the world when it comes to curling. And the last thing I want to remind you of is you get ready to play in, uh, in this great event. And uh, I would like to say uh, thanks to uh, Byron for introducing me, and thanks also to you and Virginia for making the Slam Series happen very much appreciated but my last point to all of you is this one champions come from everywhere but they especially come from Ontario so be the best that you can be are there people here from Quebec no Americans though Alberta. Americans okay <laughs> hey, just in Canada just in Canada okay and um, at any rate uh, U.S. curling is, is, is coming a long way. They are, they are definitely contenders for bronze medals at this point. But uh, I know that uh, they would like more gold just as you would. Anyway, champions come from everywhere. Thanks for your time. Good luck in the bronze field.